Um, I am Iman Ali. I'm the Policy and Programming Coordinator at the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Um, and it is my honor to be the moderator today for, for our webinar. Um, I want to take just a brief moment to allow all of our viewers um, and, and our, our devoted audience to take a moment to just recollect and, and think about what your purpose is during these turbulent times. I know here at MPAC, um, we, we speak often about our mission, which you know is to really keep informed um, and engaging with our government, our media and communities um, to, to help the public understanding for, for American Muslims. Um, you know, a lot of the work that we do, whether it's through our programming and fellowship, whether it's through our webinars, whether it's through our campaigns, we do for the benefit of American Muslims. And if you feel that this mission um, coincides with a lot of your purpose, I encourage you to go to www.mpac.org, mpac.org, um, and look into some of the ways that you can get involved because we would love to have you on our team. But enough about that. Um, today, it is my huge, huge honor to introduce um, Jarrett Berrios, who is the CEO of Red Cross LA. Um, just reading Jarrett's um, bio, I was so, so impressed. Um, he currently serves as the CEO of the American Red Cross of the Los Angeles region. And under his leadership, the LA um, region has doubled its volunteer work in preparedness and disaster response in Southern California, deepening its impact in some of Southern California's most vulnerable communities through Prepare, through Prepare LA, a part of Southern California's Prepare SoCal initiative. Um, you know, this has included its impactful work to reduce home fire deaths through the sound alarm, the campaign as well and for their leadership on developing disaster response and recovery systems after Hurricane Harvey to better serve Latino communities nationally, he and Red Cross Chicago CEO, Selena Roldan, received the Red Cross Humanitarian Services Diversity and Inclusion Award. Um, Mr. Berrios is a member of North American Humanitarian Responses Initiatives of Underdeserved Population Thematic Working Group. And prior to being in Los Angeles, he was the CEO of the Massachusetts Red Cross, where he was awarded the 2014 Presidential Award for Excellence for his leadership in the Boston Marathon bombing response. So we thank you so, so much for your service and for joining us. Um, uh, the rest of our our webinar will be moderated by our MPAC president, Salam Omeriyadi. And so I'm going to pass the torch over to you, Salam. Thank you. Thank you, Jared, for joining us. We're really honored to have you with us for this uh, discussion. And a lot of what the uh, Red Cross uh, has done is, is really central to all faiths. So we really appreciate having you come and talk about it with, uh, with our audience. Delighted to be here, Salam. Thank you. You know, I, I read in your bio that you you worked a lot on the response to the Boston Marathon bombing, and, and now you're working on the response to the COVID-19 uh, crisis. In your experience, how, how do they differ? What, what, what's the same and what's the difference between the two? So the one's a global pandemic, one is uh, you know, a terrorist act in a particular city. And for those of us in that city, in Boston at that moment, it was all consuming. It was everything. I was actually running the marathon at the time, uh, uh, five blocks from the finish line. So it was particularly with my son at the finish line waiting for me. So for some of us, it was even a bigger deal than others. But with COVID-19 affecting every state in our country, every country on the globe, there is a way in which it is so uh, expansive, so intrusive into every aspect of every person's life uh, on this planet that um, there are, there's a, there's a common bond that comes from that. I think there's a, the kind of the shared horrors of quarantine living, right? But um, in terms of some of the key issues that we focus on, that I like to focus on when I do disaster relief work, the equity issues, they're, they're just sort of geometrically larger, right? Uh, people who uh, fare poorly after disasters, poor folks, immigrant communities, uh, people of color, uh, 
who who have worse health outcomes in the regular world now have an even greater impact and have much more to fear from something like COVID-19. And so the work, at least those of us who are focused not just on the response, but in the back of our minds, about the equity of our work in that response, um, it's, uh, it can be exhausting. And there's, there's no relief in sight because this thing is gonna be with us for weeks and for months to come. And in that way, it's a much bigger thing. It's a broader, deeper, bigger, more serious, uh, crisis. You know, some have explained this to actually be wartime, uh, where we're asking factories to produce uh, more masks and more gear for uh, the people on the front lines who are not wearing army boots, but they're wearing surgical boots. So do you, do you share in that description that this is much, uh, much of a, a wartime era that we're in? I'm, uh, I'm part of the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement in the world. I'm a humanitarian and I prefer to use uh, a humanitarian metaphor uh, where, you know, after there's a disaster, we are in gray skies and gray skies, not blue skies, gray skies calls upon us to do everything within our resource, everything within our abilities to respond because it is a humanitarian crisis. And that's, that's for me the metaphor that kicks me into action every morning uh, and will uh, for the foreseeable future. You know, you mentioned the uh, underserved and there was an article in the Los Angeles Times today about how hospital staffers feel like they're second class citizens, that they're being asked to go to fight this uh, virus and to be part of the, uh, the work in, 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 in helping uh, victims who have been afflicted with this virus yet they are, they are not receiving the same health care uh, as uh, many of us can, can have access to. And so that does bring about an issue of equity in our health care system. That does bring about an issue of um, you know, certain demographics, African-Americans comprising more deaths uh, than uh, other, other groups, uh, people of color impacted more uh, than others. Do you see the same and, and how does your work in serving the underserved population, how does that um, unfold in this, in this times of crisis? So I, I, in a previous version of my life, I used to run a large health foundation. This was in Boston. And we were very involved in increasing access to healthcare, ins insurance coverage mostly, but other forms of coverage as well. And it was, it, it, it goes without saying, but it, but it shouldn't, that people, the people who are uninsured are the same populations that we're now talking about being impacted, populations that live in food deserts and so don't have the ability uh, to, to eat uh, uh, as healthfully, uh, people that don't necessarily have the ability to get exercise, they don't have the, the time or the resources to join gyms and get the sort of exercise which makes them more resilient, their health more resilient. All of these things um, are sort of, the term comorbidities is often used. Um, so it's not just for, that's not just for smokers and so forth, but, but people who are poor in our country, and those tend to be disproportionately people of color, immigrants, these are uh, communities that are going to be more impacted by the virus and not incidentally they're also more likely not to have health care coverage and therefore to defer going to the doctor to the emergency room until later when it's more serious when it's harder to treat uh, and therefore with worse outcomes there's a, a whole bunch of uh, almost sort of self-fulfilling prophecies that play out uh, in this sort of scenario Standing back from this, there's a very robust, or was a robust conversation. Uh, I think it was during the Democratic primary, but it was broader than just those of us who were, you know, those who were Democrats, around what should our healthcare system look like. And I think this is going to be a shot in the arm for people to really think about a system, whether it's single payer or not, but a system that is able to provide broader coverage to more people, so that people don't have to make life or death choices around whether to go see the doctor if they think they might have COVID-19 or not. Um, that doesn't just hurt them. Uh, as we know in a pandemic, that affects all of us. Our ability to come out of quarantine is going to be when all of us are healthy again. And if there are some of us afraid to go to the doctor 
uh, some of us who feel like they have to work under the table to pay the bills and put themselves at risk, that's going to mean it's going to be a longer time for all of us to come out. It's a, sort of be a, sort of an interesting sort of communitarian challenge that we're facing in, um, with this pandemic, not to get too abstract with it, but um, it brings home those realities, those injustices, those inequities uh, to, to all of us, because all of us are affected by those inequities in this particular case. Um, so there are other organizations internationally that fall under the same umbrella of service as the Red Cross. One is the Red Crescent. So what, what, uh, what's the relationship between the Red Cross and the Red Crescent? Well, they're the same organization, actually. Um, or to be specific, we are all part of, uh, there is under our, our principles, there can only be one Red Cross or Red Crescent Society in a country um, recognized. And they are all members of the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. That's the IFRC. And that's sort of like the UN of Red Cross and Red Crescent societies. Uh, so it, in that we all pay dues, they have a convention every couple of years and pass rules. But most importantly, when there's a big disaster, uh, for example, there was um, the, the, the Japanese tsunami, earthquake and tsunami, countries don't just sort of offer their support or Red Crosses don't just come in, they work through the International Federation so that aid assistance is coordinated uh, countries have certain specialties that they offer. All of that is done through the coordination of the International Federation. Now, whether a country is a Red Cross or a Red Crescent, um, it, it sort of depends on the society. You tend to see Red Crescents in Muslim countries, uh, but the Red Cross is not, not actually a religious symbol. Um, the Red Cross comes from, it's the inverse of the Swiss flag, and it was founded by the Swiss. Uh, and it was founded on the basis of neutrality after a war. There was a war going on in Northern Italy between the French and the Austro-Hungarian empires. And the idea was there needed to be a neutral third party entity that could take care of the injured on the battlefield uh, because the French couldn't retrieve their injured without being shot at by the Austro-Hungarians and vice versa. 10,000 men died in the Battle of Solferino and the lesson for some uh, who left that, and there was a Swiss gentleman named Henri Dunant, who was inspired to, to found a neutral organization, and those neutrality principles, which were sort of also endemic in Switzerland, in that, in that government, were the reason that the symbol of the cross, which is, was the inverse of the flag. Uh, I think it was in the 1920s that the first Red Crescent Society was formed, and that was in Turkey, and since then, there have been other Red Crescents, but we are all equal under the banner of the International Federation. And the international symbol, uh, at a, if you were to be at a humanitarian response, and that might be in wartime or that might be after disaster, you see both the cross and the crescent next to one another uh, on uh, our vests that we wear uh, when we go into, uh, into battle zones and so forth. So while people are fleeing danger, the Red Cross and Red Crescent are moving in to help those who are the victims uh, of catastrophes of war. Yeah, in, in that case, I mean, and there are many other important organizations, the International Medical Corps, Doctors Without Borders. Uh, there's a lot of important humanitarian organizations. We are proud uh, to be among them and providing that support. Here in the United States, the American Red Cross has a division that focuses on international services. Much of that work is done with immigrants here, war refugees here, but we also have programs in about 10 countries around the globe that we target uh, in Asia and in Latin America. So here in Los Angeles, we have a stay home order like many parts of the country, uh, but at the same time, we hear that there's a need to give blood uh, because now the hospitals are full and they, they need blood for transfusion. So how, how do we manage the, that situation where you got the stay home, stay home order, but you, know, you, you feel that, that moral compunction to give blood? Absolutely. We, I hope you do at least. <laughs> you do, Slam. Thank you for that. Um, 
one of the jobs of the Red Cross in the United States, and it's not in every country, but in the United States, our role is to secure the nation's blood supply. And uh, that doesn't mean we collect all the blood. There are a lot of other blood banks in the United States. We collect about 40 to 45% of the, the blood supply. We are by far the largest uh, blood uh, collector, collection entity in the United States. But what we also do is make sure that if there's a shortage in one part of the country, we can deliver blood to ensure that there's not gonna be uh, no blood on the shelves and that people will needlessly suffer as a result. When COVID-19 struck, we saw an extraordinary number of blood drives around the country, ours and others, uh, just cancel. And they canceled because many of them were at work. About 80% of the blood we collect is collected at these drives. The other 20% are, we collect at our own facilities. People call up and make an appointment and come in and give at the facility. So with all these drives that were being canceled, we were down to about a two day supply of blood on the shelves of many hospitals. Now, the good news is, uh, if there's any good news with a stay at home order, there are fewer people uh, being rushed to the emergency room from car accidents because fewer numbers of us are in our cars. Uh, there are fewer elective surgeries that require blood and therefore less demand for blood in many cases. But there's many people, people who are going through cancer treatment, um, uh, people who might have uh, a chronic disease that require blood, uh, blood on a regular basis. And so we were really challenged for a while to get, uh, to get those uh, blood drives going or get people to make donations. And to your point, how do you make a donation if we're all told we're supposed to be in lockdown? Well, Giving blood is one of those essential programs or essential services that you're allowed to go do. And fortunately, many people in LA and many people across the country have given blood to the point where we went from just a two day blood supply to almost, we're almost back up to about a seven day supply of blood on the shelves, which is just a wonderful tribute to the generosity uh, and the sort of civic mindedness of Angelines here in Los Angeles, of Californians, of people all across the US, from all uh, creeds, from all colors, people step forward uh, to give. And we're very pleased about that. Now, fortunately, we, we need people to keep doing that. And so we're encouraging people, if you can, make an appointment, go to redcrossblood.org. You just put in your zip code, it'll tell you what the closest place is. Uh, appointments now are about two weeks out, so you can, um, you can still go. And uh, the question that we get, Salam, is, is it safe to give blood in this environment where you're supposed to be social distancing? And the truth is we've had to really reinvent how we collect blood. When you show up to give blood, your temperature is taken, just like every staff person at the blood drive gets taken outside the building and then again while you're in line inside the building. We need larger spaces to do our blood drives because we have both the lines are socially distanced and the beds where people give are further apart from one another. And they are regularly disinfected. Uh, and, and it probably goes without saying, but, but giving blood is already a pretty uh, antiseptic process, a fairly safe process. It's heavily regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. Um, your arm uh, gets, cl gets cleansed with alcohol. The, the needles that are used are unique for you and then disposed of. All of these things are, uh, and always have been, uh, very safe, very hygienic. But we also go to great lengths to make sure there's plenty of sanitizer uh, and there are many of disinfectant wipes so that surfaces are cleaned regularly between every donation uh, to make sure that it's safe. Uh, and so, yeah, we've, uh, we've had to reinvent all that. We've had to add a lot of processes. It takes a little longer now because of all that but uh, but we think it's worth it. People need to feel good about giving blood, not just good um, uh, in their hearts for, for the act of giving, but also um, we want them to feel safe, good in that it's safe to give and they're not putting themselves at risk. I'm oh, sorry. What's your volunteer to staff ratio? Well, um, 
in overall terms, we have, um, if it's, if it's ba we, we base that number on hours because, you know, staff work full time, volunteers may work 10 hours a week or something. So based on hours, uh, we have about 8,000 volunteers in LA. We have about 80 paid staff. But when you add all their hours in, it's about um, 90 to 95% of our work is done by volunteers and about 10% by amazing. paid staff. Yeah. And that's, that's, but that's not unique to LA or unique to the American Red Cross. The Red Cross internationally is a volunteer organization. One out of every 20 people in the world um, either is served by or serves as a Red Crosser. It's a, an amazing organization with international reach. Countries like Indonesia and the Philippines, India. Um, I was in Jordan. I spent uh, much of my summer, last summer in Jordan. A very large Red Crescent and Red Cross societies there engaged in many different activities, things that we don't necessarily do here, but in their countries, uh, quite active. Um, and, and when it comes to the volunteers, have you seen a decline uh, due to the COVID-19 crisis? Uh, interestingly, we've seen just the opposite. We have, uh, we've partnered with, and this is in LA, I'm going to speak now about our Red Cross in our hometown here. Um, we have, like many other communities, we had to close our schools. And many of the children in our Los Angeles Unified School District, about 80% of those children, uh, about almost 600,000 kids, are on free and reduced lunch. And what that means is they were getting two, in some cases, three meals a day from school. And with these school closures, along with their parents, in many cases, losing their jobs, we saw introduced into our community the threat of massive, massive food insecurity. So uh, the Los Angeles Unified School District wanted to give out meals, and they approached us to partner with them to provide the volunteer workforce uh, at what we're calling grab and go centers. So at about 65 sites around the school district, and these are middle schools and high schools, people can drive up between seven and 11 in the morning, walk up or drive up. Uh, they don't even have to get out of their car. We, at a socially distanced way, we, we drop the food in. Uh, they tell us how many meals they need. We drop the food in. We also talk to them. Uh, we have an AmeriCorps program in our AmeriCorps, talk to them about how they can stay safe and healthy uh, despite the coronavirus outbreak, uh, the things they need to do to keep themselves and their families safe uh, as well. And we've, uh, we've given out over 6 million meals. We've uh, had about 30,000 conversations at the car door, not at the car door, six feet from the car door, but conversations nonetheless. And, and with the food, we're providing safety information as well. Uh, and so all of this uh, has required us to go out to the community and ask for more volunteers. Many of our volunteers are over 65, and so we're discouraging them from participating. But we've had over 800 new volunteers come in to volunteer at the schools over the last three weeks. So we've been blessed to have an infusion of new volunteers. Uh, they've heard about it through uh, social media. We have a partnership with LinkedIn where LinkedIn is promoting the volunteer opportunity. They're literally sending emails, they call them in-mails on LinkedIn, encouraging people to consider the volunteer opportunity and, and many people are stepping forward. So in about two weeks, we're gonna start Ramadan, so it's not advisable for a Muslim to, to give blood while he or she is fasting. Uh, but, <laughs> but we'd like to give, and, and we've, had, we've actually had blood drives at our mosques um, and do you advise people uh, to, to should, should we give before we start our fast? Because also after a month of fasting, we are generally dehydrated. Uh, at what point is it safe, do you think, to start giving blood? Well, if you're, if you're a healthy adult who, and by that I mean you don't have any sort of chronic diseases or anything that maybe require occasional hospitalization, right? Um, and, uh, and you're sort of above 150 pounds, uh, I would say after Ramadan, after two or three days, your, your body gets pretty normalized. Um, and I mean, I hope you don't get 
that dehydrated after um well actually muslims are good at uh, partying right after ramadan so yes they they were i was i was in amman <laughs> jordan during ramadan last year i saw a lot of parties <laughs> they were just after they were just late at night and they would go really late at night yep <laughs> that might be why they need to recover from ramadan. Even, even during ramadan they do that at night so <laughs> absolutely no it was amazing but um, um let, yeah, let, I would I would say wait till after Ramadan and and, and interestingly we you know we're going to have the big need here uh, one part of our blood collection stuff that's relevant to this point is that about 30% of the blood we're collecting comes from schools, high schools and colleges. And so with the school closures and then likely closures over the summer, we're probably not going to have be able to have Blood, a lot of our regular blood drives through August. So um, I would say to uh, mosques and uh, Muslim community institutions that want to do a blood drive, wait till after Ramadan. We're going to need people in June, July, and August all the same. So uh, just step up, uh, reach out to us, and we'll set it up. We could even schedule it now uh, so that you do it around uh, convenient time for you all. That'd be great. Um, what about this idea now of donating plasma as part of the convalescence for COVID-19 patients? Isn't it interesting? So for people that don't necessarily, aren't following this that closely, I want to say that it's a therapy that is um, believed to be helpful, but like many things, right? Uh, there's no, it's not a cure for COVID-19. And what that therapy is, is they are, for people, um, you know, presuming a basic level of science in the participants here today, um, people probably know what an antibody is, right? So you, your body, when it resists uh, a, a virus uh, invading, they develop these antibodies, which sort of take on the virus. Um, and I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but somebody who has recovered from COVID-19 will have those antibodies for several months still in their bloodstream. And the idea with what they call convalescent plasma, the antibodies live in the part of the blood that we call plasma. And that plasma in, from somebody who has survived COVID-19, if transfused to somebody who's coming down with it, those antibodies can help build up antibody resistance in the person just coming down with it more rapidly. Well, that's the theory, that's the belief. And, there have been a lot of um, early successes with this, enough that the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration here in the United States, has invited Red Cross as that partner, right? We, again, we are the largest entity collecting blood. We have the largest network to begin to identify people who've recovered and who are willing to donate plasma. So donating plasma is just donating blood. We then separate the plasma out of the blood and that plasma is what gets transfused into the new person well that's how it's proposed to work it's still in development that's uh that, that that's wonderful thank you for providing that explanation and and for that service uh Iman, uh i'll hand it back to you for some questions wonderful so First, um, Jared, I feel like my mom is going to want to talk to you in your ability to get people to volunteer because I know having us home, she's she's lucky if we we do a few chores. So so I'll have to connect <laughs> her. Um, but but it's so great to hear that that you are getting to sustainable help because um, I've always I remember even in high school how important the the blood drives were. So so great work and, and we're happy to help um, moving forward as well. Um, our question and answers are popping so I'm gonna get get going as as they've asked. So our first question is that a lot of blood donation centers only have the option for A slash B plasma, A B plasma. What is that and is it possible to just donate blood? It is possible to just donate blood. And typically when you make an appointment, we don't even ask uh, what your blood type is. There are, the, the universal donors are the most useful because those blood, that blood can support anybody. And typically what happens, I'm gonna be honest, okay? Typically what happens if you are, if you, if you do have the you know, universal blood type, right? Um, you get on our list and we call you every 60 days to see if you're willing to come back in because that blood is the most important, but all blood saves lives, to be clear. And 
and, and the hope is that uh, anybody who has recovered, that they're, right now at least, we anybody who's recovered, their plasma is uh, needed, and we're hoping that they will identify themselves. We're not yet collecting it. We're going to begin doing that, we believe, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but we are starting to create a, a, a data bank, a data base of people who are who have recovered and are willing to give. So share with us who who is a universal donor. What blood type? So I'm not a scientist, right? Uh. I, I I think it's AB is the AB positive is the universal donor. Um, I'm O positive, so I'm not. But um, uh, I need to. I probably should double check that uh, before I go, come on. <laughs> Yeah, this is not a bio, this is not a biochemistry class. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, and we can we can absolutely <laughs> um, redirect. And I feel like in our in our chat box as well, we have a few people saying that you're right. So I'm right, that's, right? That's okay. Great to hear. Yeah, good, good, good. good so our I'm next not the question, scientist. That's okay. <laughs> I was an English major. Um, the next question that we have then is that there is a lot of misinformation about who can and cannot donate blood. Can you provide some basic information on the guidelines, for example, yeah. health and travel history? Yeah, so really interesting. Uh, the FDA actually just modified a number of these requirements. I don't know all of them. There are about 33, what they call um, 33, 34 things that the FDA um, triggers, which may limit your ability to give blood. Um, the some of those are connected to travel some of those are connected to maybe where you lived as a child somebody i work with grew up in england and because of mad cow in england uh, the mad cow disease that spread that um, until just last week that was a permanent disqualifier in the united states from giving blood that was one of the things they changed last week um, so there, there are, they call them deferrals. You're deferred from giving. Sometimes based on the country, Haiti, a lot of times people traveling to Haiti, traveling to places where there's malaria and other, sometimes can lead to a 60 or a 90 day deferral. Um, if you are, um, if you've had a tattoo, uh, that results in, I think it's a 90 day deferral, but that was also recently changed by the FDA. So there are different, um, Reasons that the FDA has deferred. One thing I like to say though is those aren't Red Cross rules. Uh, those are the rules of the federal government about the blood that uh, any blood bank uh, can collect. And so sometimes there are groups, for example, gay men are allowed, uh, are deferred from giving blood in most cases. Um, that's an FDA rule. Um, and it feels sometimes like, we, like, like we're discriminating on that. We don't necessarily, have an opinion on that science, um, but that is something that the FDA sets out. They actually just modified, that's another rule that just got modified from a 12 month to a three month deferral uh, for gay men. And so that's, uh, there's a lot of things changing with COVID uh, because of the need right now. Um, and um, maybe there are lessons to be learned about those deferrals, right? People that want to give should be able to give. Uh, I suspect that's a lesson kicking around in there somewhere. Absolutely. So, you know, a lot of the questions um, that we're receiving are specifically even asking about diabetics. So can diabetics donate blood if their diabetes is under control? I think that those are the, that question is actually one that I would, I would first ask my primary care physician. Um, I mean, to, to say blanket that people with uh, diabetes, even if it's under control, can or shouldn't, should or shouldn't give, I would say, I know people with diabetes who give, um, they're healthy, they don't take insulin, um, but sometimes a doctor has very specific reasons why they would uh, say no to that. And so it's really the kind of question, rather than giving a blanket statement, that you should talk to your primary care physician about. Wonderful. And just to go off of, um, you know, the protocol on reporting a little bit about once you know, we've given blood. I, I remember in high school giving blood at all. They would ask us, you know, have you had a fever? Are you taking any medicine? Yeah. How are you feeling today? You mentioned yourself, the, the temperature that they check. So I want to know, you know, many people are, are frequent donors uh, to, to the Red Cross, but what happens now in this time where they say that symptoms can take, you know, up to two weeks to show? What, what is it on, you know, the civilian's responsibility to report if they start feeling ill once they've um, donated. Well, 
A couple things I want to note. First of all, the blood itself doesn't transmit COVID-19. This is a respiratory virus, not a blood-borne pathogen, okay? So as, at least as far as anybody knows, there's no case of a coronavirus of any sort, SARS, whatever, uh, transmitted by blood, okay? So it would be, the, the issue then in giving is if you realize, say a week later, that you have COVID-19, who were the people you were in close proximity with? If you did it correctly, right, if you were socially distant, essentially what social distancing is, is assuming that you have the virus and you want to keep a distance so that you don't infect anybody else. That's why we socially distance. And you should, when you go into a public, when you come out of your house and you go in public, you should assume that. And you should assume that you stay away from people so that you don't uh, transmit the virus, even obviously hoping that you don't have it, but you want to take clear so that in the event that you do, you aren't in a position of trying to let every, everybody know that, uh, that you've been close to, that you are now in quarantine and that they now need to go into quarantine because the protocol is if you've been exposed by somebody uh, to somebody who has it, you're supposed to go into 14 day quarantine. Um, and that can be avoided if people are just very conscious about staying away, keeping distant from one another. Absolutely. I know that quarantine can sometimes sound so nice, a mini vacation, but at times it's very hard for people. So I commend our viewers and I commend everyone who is, who is practicing social distancing because together we will get through this. So now Jared, I want to ask one final question, um, which I think is, you know, one of the most important things to ask with, with this, the times changing and a lot of organizations having to restructure the way that they're serving. Um, what more do you think that there is to do now? And how can our viewers or anyone who wants to get involved be able to help in the upcoming months? Well, I appreciate you asking that, Iman. The, the core of our work is the volunteer. Um, and there's a lot of volunteering uh, that are needed right now. We have uh, the school, you know, school should have gone to until June 12th. We will be feeding kids until then uh, here in LA. If you're anywhere in the country watching this, um, giving blood or even more importantly, perhaps organizing a blood drive uh, so that there is sufficient blood products in your local hospital is a very important thing that you can do to sort of pass the gift of life forward. Um, and that's so important. And, and so many of our faith traditions even sort of talk about the gift of life. Blood is the gift of life and giving, um, uh, sort of being able to save the life of another and what that means. That is what blood represents. And in fact, um, the blood gets separated into your, your, your platelets, you have your blood. There's, there's so many different ways uh, blood helps. One pint can help save three different lives. Uh, so, so finding a way to give uh, by giving blood, uh, whether individually or perhaps as a faith community or as a school um, would be extraordinary. And I understand that there are some limitations around Ramadan, but we can plan now for when Ramadan's over. So, Absolutely. Right. You know, the, the Prophet Muhammad, he said that even a smile is charity. So if, if anyone of us can smile, we can smile our way down to our local blood donation. And I'm sure, um, maybe not smile when we're getting pricked, but afterwards when we it's get- not the so snack, it's, it's not so bad. It's not so bad. I think also the, uh, like you said, the Quran and the Torah say that if you save one life, it's as if you save all of humanity. Yeah, so that's, that's a beautiful line. That's the principle by which we follow and, and, and we, we, we connect with people like you. And we also at MPAC are working on a, a campaign for human security. You know, a lot of governments talk about national security and, you know, the security apparatus and more intelligence and more uh, military funding. Human security is about the security of masses, the, the, the right of people for health care, the right of health care for people, that is. So we're working on that. And, and I think uh, the America Red Cross, the Red Cross chapter here in Los Angeles, we feel that connection with you because we're all working for that human security. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So, so happy to have you as a partner. Well, it's wonderful to have you and hope, hope well, I'm sure we're going to see each other again. Let's hope. Okay. 
So thank you so much again, Jarrett, for joining us. Um, for, for those of you who kind of just tuned in or uh, missed a bit of our, our show, we are on Facebook Live. So I encourage you to join our Facebook group or Facebook page to, to see any of the video. Um, as well as, just as Salam was mentioning, you know, as many of you have probably seen and felt in your own community, the impact of COVID-19 has sincerely, you know, been a devastating one. Um, what's more discouraging is that in a recent report by the CDC, nearly 33% of fatalities from corona in the U.S. have been patients of color, um, most often African-American and Black individuals. So some states, you know, just off the top of my head, Louisiana has a... Um, African-American Black population of about 22%, yet 70% of corona fatalities have been um, Black patients. So this health disparity, you know, we know is, is nothing really new, but corona has nearly amplified the national attention many of these communities of colors need and deserve. Um, so for, for example, access to health care, protection for laborers valiantly serving on the front lines, reform in the criminal justice system, um, these are merely you know, the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the justice required. But we at MPAC, just as Salam said, are so devoted to amplifying human security for our brothers and sisters from communities of color. And we've actively been working with members of Congress to include resources, protections, and reform into upcoming legislation. And though our endeavors are just beginning, um, they're nowhere near complete. I know because I'm working late into the night, but it's worth every, every minute. Um, and we really hope that you join us in staying active, involved, and and informed in our campaign for human security. Um, and then just the last kind of bit is that if you enjoyed this webinar, which absolutely I know that I did, and I'm sure everyone who's watching definitely learned quite a bit, please join us for our next webinar on Monday at three o'clock Pacific time, six o'clock Eastern Standard Time with Rabbi Moline from the Interfaith Alliance. Um, and you can catch all of our upcoming webinars on www.mpac.org forward slash webinars. Um, you know, your support, both financially, through social media, and attendance of our programming, really keeps our team very motivated and able to serve. And especially now that Ramadan is coming up, I, I humbly ask all of our viewers to keep MPAC in mind with your zakat and charity giving. You can find our donation link at www.mpac.org. Um, and again, thank you so much, and we look forward to having you join our next webinar. And thank you so much again, Jarrett, for joining. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.